Welcome, friend. Follow me. We're going somewhere dark, somewhere dangerous. Most people would never dare enter the place we are going. There's no telling what horrors we'll find, what terrors we'll uncover. Don't say I didn't warn you. We might discover terrible monsters lurking there. Be careful, they could follow you out. Or maybe they're already inside you. Are you afraid? Good. Now you are ready to enter the Warning Woods. I remember that walk. Most of the walks my family went on together have been overwritten by more exciting memories. But that walk, back in 2009, I will always remember. Part of the reason is how ungodly the heat was that night. I remember begging mom to go back inside and not suffer the sweltering, humid blanket that had fallen over our neighborhood. Mom might have given in, but dad insisted we do our usual loop around the block. Halfway around the block, we saw the other reason I remember that walk so well. There was a newly constructed wooden box on a post next to the sidewalk. It looked like a large birdhouse or a beehive. It was the first little library I had ever seen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, a little library is a big wooden box that people put books in to share with the neighbors and anyone passing by. The idea is that you take books out and put them back when you're done, or put books you don't need anymore in for other people to read. This is all information I've gathered after the fact. Back in 09, I don't think anyone really knew what a little library was. We never learned who built the one we found, but it must have been an idea they had on their own. Thinking ahead of their time, I guess. Mom found a Shirley Jackson novel she hadn't read and found my dad something by Hunter S. Thompson. Hell's Angels, I think. I was seven, which is a hard age for a kid when it comes to reading. Most things targeted at that reading level are dull, uninteresting, or stupid. But I found an old storybook with some intrigue. Its cover had been worn by decades, maybe even a century of use and abuse. Faded gold letters were emblazoned on the binding, but I didn't recognize them. They weren't from a language I knew, which only included English and some basic Spanish back then. I found a few languages with similar looking alphabets recently, but I don't have the book anymore to compare them to. I can't be sure which language was written on the binding, but they all have certain commonalities. First, there are visual similarities. Every one of the alphabets uses thin, straight lines to create letters that all appear unique together, but individually are difficult to recognize. They are more accurately described as runes. There are no curves or arcs in these runes like we have in English letters. Second, they are all dead languages. Every alphabet I found that looked at all similar to the letters on that book belonged to languages that have been out of common practice for centuries. The last commonality is their original region. Every one of these languages, and I found a dozen or so, come from Scandinavia, Iceland, or really Northern Europe in general. They're all variations of or precursors to the North Germanic languages. So with all this information in mind, I've decided the storybook had most likely come from that part of the world, probably sometime in the 19th century, and somehow ended up in my neighborhood borrowing library. But you know what the strangest part was? Inside the cover, the entire book was written in perfect, modern English. Of course, back then, at seven years old, I thought nothing of the worn cover, old runes, and inconsistent language. I just thought it looked... cool. One of my parents asked me what the book was, and I told them it looked like a collection of stories, which it was. I said it looked fun to read before bed. I had always been a fan of Aesop's fables, Grimm's fairy tales, and that sort of short story genre. I thought I would try out a few of the stories and just bring the book back if I didn't like it. I didn't know, how could I have, how inexplicably difficult that would be to do. I settled into my bed that night, wrestling my pillow with the back of my head until I was fully comfortable before reaching over to the nightstand. I had left the book there when we had returned from the walk, and by now it had filled my room with a musty, woody scent. 
It made me think of an old tree. I want to be clear, this was not some passing observation. My mind formed a vivid image of a specific old tree, one I felt sure I had never seen before, in a forest full of vegetation that didn't grow anywhere nearby. It appeared every time I closed my eyes. I could ignore the vision or delve into it. I usually chose the latter. I found it made me feel more connected to the stories if I spent some time envisioning the forest beforehand. Every detail was so pristine. I thought I must have seen a photo of the forest at some point and only stored the memory subconsciously. The first story wasn't as interesting as I had hoped, but it held my attention. It was about a 16-year-old girl who lived on the edge of a dark forest. It was set in a time and place where arranged marriages must have still been common practice. Above the text, there was a crude illustration of an angelic young girl. This girl, this poor child, was betrothed to a 37-year-old farmer who had recently lost his wife in a horse accident. The girl felt she would never be able to love a man so much older than her, especially since she would still be young when he inevitably died and left her a widow but not young enough to remarry. She was destined to be a spinster. The day before her arranged marriage, the girl was walking along the edge of the forest one last time. She heard something rustle behind her and turned to see a person cloaked in dark tattered robes and bearing a tall staff emerge from between two trees. The person's face was hidden behind the shadows of a deep hood. The forest is lonely the mysterious stranger said. It desires care and tender love. Would you forsake your betrothed and instead wed the great lonesome forest? How does one wed a forest? She asked. Be a keeper of its secrets, a protector of its children, a listening ear, a caring nurse. But, but that is so unnatural. I can't even begin to understand what you mean she said. The stranger pounded the heavy staff into the ground to silence the girl. This offer will only be made once while you remain young and uncorrupted. Join the world that currently awaits you, and you will quickly be consumed by the strife and suffering of humanity. The forest offers you only one chance to avoid this pain. The girl thought for a while as the stranger stood and awaited her answer. As much as she hated the idea of marrying the farmer, she couldn't begin to understand the stranger's offer. She questioned how she could even trust the mysterious person and wondered if it was just a ploy to trick her into entering the dark woods alone. I'm sorry, she finally said. I choose to wed my betrothed. The stranger pounded the same spot with the staff then vanished into the woods without a trace. The girl did marry the farmer, and soon found him to be terrifying and abusive towards her. She became a servant rather than a wife, and would be punished severely if she neglected a chore or didn't get her work done before day's end. Fast forwarding a little, the girl met someone who had secretly witnessed the death of the farmer's first wife. It was no accident. He had told her to check something behind a horse, and when she had positioned herself directly behind its hind legs, the farmer spooked the animal and caused it to kick back with the full brunt of its power. His wife had been killed instantly, and her death appeared perfectly accidental. Judging by the way the farmer treated her, the girl knew a similar end could very easily be in store for her. She devised a way to ensure her survival, at least for a few months. Soon, she was pregnant with the farmer's child. She had been correct. His hands stayed off her for as long as she had the man's daughter inside her. But as soon as she gave birth to the girl, the hands quickly returned. She was forced back into servitude, expected to perform all of her original tasks while also caring for the newborn child. When the constant fear and torment became too much to bear, the girl, a young woman now, took her daughter and fled into the forest on horseback. There she was greeted once more by the hooded stranger. 
I've changed my mind. I can't live with him. I'm here to pledge myself to the forest, she desperately told the cloaked figure. As I told you, the forest will only accept the pure, the uncorrupted. You have been scarred. The stranger's head tilted just slightly towards the sleeping child in the woman's arms. She can yet be saved. She is too young to give herself. You must give her up to the forest. To the young woman's horror, she heard the sounds of approaching horses and angry men. Her husband had awoken and found her gone. She had to make a decision quickly. Yes, she exclaimed after only a moment's consideration. Please keep her safe. Protect her, and in turn she will protect the forest when she's grown. The stranger reached forth with two long arms hidden by drooping robes, and the woman placed her child in them. When the stranger turned to retreat into the trees, the woman tried to follow on her horse. The stranger turned back and said, No, you made your choice. Now you must live with the consequences of your decision. With that, the figure vanished into the darkness with the baby girl. The woman couldn't bear to return to her terrible life. She withdrew a long rope from the saddle and tossed it around a low branch that protruded from the forest's edge. As the angry voices and hooves approached, she tied one end of the rope around the trunk of the tree and the other around her neck. Just as her husband appeared over a ridge, she ordered her horse into a gallop. It rushed off, leaving her dangling and gasping for breaths she no longer wanted. She was dead long before her husband could cut her down. And that's where the story ended. Tragic, but darkly fascinating. I was too tired to read any more stories that night. I fell asleep wondering if there was a hidden message or moral to the story. If there was, it had evaded me. I dreamt of the tree that night. It looked just as it had when I was awake, only now it held the sleeping baby out on one branch and the dead hanged woman on the other. They both looked so still and peaceful. I could still picture the tree when I woke up the next morning. The smell of the book greeted me as I stirred, and I rolled over to stare at its faded gold binding a while. I lost many minutes, maybe even an hour, studying each rune and trying to guess what they meant. Eventually, I picked the book up and cracked it open to the next story. The illustration above this one depicted a wide-eyed rabbit running from a demonic-looking man. His features were exaggerated and distorted to make him appear monstrous. His eyes were full of fury and he was aiming a musket down at the fearful animal. The story began with the rabbit nervously approaching the edge of the woods. It had never left the sweeping cover of the sturdy oaks and elms and birches, but now, as it crouched near the border, it wondered what the sun would feel like on its fur. In a moment of rare courage, the animal bounded out of the woods and found itself at the top of a hill looking down on a quiet village. There. It saw animals it had never seen before. Horses, pigs, cows, and humans. None of these new creatures bore the fangs, claws, or beaks of the predators the rabbit had learned to avoid. These animals looked slow and harmless, so the rabbit decided to get closer. Again, there were numerous details and descriptions in the story that I'm deliberately bypassing for the sake of time. So, let's just skip to the part where the rabbit enters the village and is spotted by a man who grabs his gun and chases the rabbit back up the hill. The poor animal doesn't know what a gun is, but it recognizes the look in the man's eyes. He didn't have fangs, claws, or a beak, but he had a predator's gaze. As the rabbit ran up the hill, the man fired a shot and hit the animal's foot, taking it clean off. The injured rabbit still managed to hobble into the forest. The man got to the edge of the forest, intending to follow the blood trail to his prey, but a dark sensation prevented him from entering. He stood at the tree line for some time as a feeling of being watched overcame him. The forest had never upset him before, but something about it was making him uneasy now. Spooked, he headed back to the village. The man dreamt of a naked young woman that night, but he took no pleasure in seeing her. Her skin was pearlescent and clean, despite being deep in the forest. She had emerged from behind a tree and had long red hair that flowed in an absent breeze. 
Her features were sharp, pointed like arrows directed straight at the man's heart. The dream seemed to last for hours as the woman stepped closer and closer. The man couldn't move. He could only watch her approach with weighted anticipation. Her eyes never left his, and they were full of hatred. With renewed confidence brought on by Dawn, the man decided to confront the forest. He needed to remind himself it was just trees and brush, not some malevolent force. For comfort, he brought his musket along. He stood again at the forest's edge and watched the gentle swaying of the trees for a while. He had almost calmed himself, convinced himself the danger had just been a dream, when something moved. One of the trees seemed to bulge near the middle of its trunk. Then the bulge separated itself from the tree, and the man could see it was actually a woman. She was naked, like in his dream, but she was neither young nor beautiful. Her body was drooping with age and covered in thick green moss. Her long red hair, which looked like it may have flowed softly at one time, now hung in clumps around her knurled face and was full of leaves and twigs. The woman raised a hand in which she held something brown and bloody. Flies swarmed around the limp thing. With a hostile shriek, she hurled the object at the man who only just stepped back in time to avoid the missile. It landed on the grass with a crackling squelch, and he saw it was the rabbit. Maggots had already gorged themselves on its eyes and filled its mouth and ears. It smelled putrid like disease. When the man looked back up, he found the woman was now standing at the very edge of the forest, an arm's length away. He raised his musket, but she just smiled at him, inviting him to shoot her. This gave the man pause long enough for the woman to catch him off guard. She grabbed the barrel and pointed it down at the man's foot, which made him flinch so hard he accidentally pulled the trigger. The man howled and fell onto his back. The woman grabbed his wounded foot and shoved one finger into the jagged hole. The very same moss that coated her entire body began spreading across the man's foot, ankle, and calf. He could feel it growing inside him, too. An intense pressure replaced all other feeling in his leg as it went numb. He couldn't move. The growth was overtaking his stomach now, inside and out. He could feel it spreading to his heart, his blood being slowed by the spongy matter that now lined his organs and clogged his veins. The last image the man saw was the woman standing over him, holding the rabbit again and slowly lowering it toward his mouth. I slammed the book shut. The first story had been tragic, but this one was just appalling. I couldn't believe what I had just read. I couldn't shake the image of the rotting rabbit being buried inside the helpless man. Once I overcame my initial distaste, however, I realized these stories could be connected. I had originally thought the book was just a random collection of folktales, but now wondered if they contained a running theme. Was this some sort of historical lore? My renewed curiosity is all that prevented me from returning the book to the little library that day. Instead, I hid it beneath my pillow. I didn't want my mom to stumble into my room and read that last story. I thought she might never let me choose a book on my own again. I remember seeing the tree somewhat constantly throughout the following day. It no longer waited for my eyelids to close to appear. Stranger still, whether it was through a window, in a picture, or on our evening walk, every tree I saw that day was superimposed by the tree from the vision. Sometimes the young woman hung from a branch or her child would be perched on one. Sometimes a man was hanging there. A man covered in moss with blood smeared across his mouth. The vision seemed to have life, and I felt like the tree was closing in on me. I wondered if I should dispose of the book, but then wondered if the visions would really fade if I did so. More specifically, I wondered what would happen if they didn't. The book was my only link to the ghostly tree, and I decided I had to keep it close. I needed to learn anything it had to tell me. Over the course of the week, I finished the book. I forgot many of the tales, it contained close to a dozen. But most recounted events similar to the second story. An unwitting person would innocently slight the forest or its inhabitants and pay an awful price. 
the mysterious woman always made an appearance. Sometimes she was shrouded in darkness and shadow, other times she was coated in thick moss. I came to fear her as if she were real. To understand why, you need to hear the final story. Each tale recounted more and more recent events. The eleventh story, for example, had taken place in 1921 and reflected accurate terminology for that time, at least as far as I could tell. I thought the book may have been published and printed around that time based on the book's appearance. That seemed perfectly plausible. But when I flipped to the twelfth and final story, I was disturbed to find it took place in 1997, meaning the book was either a mere 25 years old at most, or its author had been eerily skilled at predicting and imitating people from future eras. The first possibility seemed more probable, but still incredibly unlikely based on the book's condition. The twelfth story went something like this. A foreign family moved into the area. What area exactly was never made clear in the text. They acquired some farmland bordering the forest. No buildings existed yet on the land, so the father hired a contractor to build a house, barn, and separate tool shed. The bill for hauling in the lumber nearly doubled the materials cost, so the contractor pitched the idea of using a few of the trees on the family's land to build the structures. The family had to deliberate for some time about this decision. Unbeknownst to the contractor, the trees weren't actually within their property line. The father had intentionally neglected to tell him this because he personally didn't see the harm in harvesting a few nearby trees to save time, money, and resources. There were plenty of other trees, he reasoned. He also promised his children he would plant new trees to replace those used for their buildings. The contractor and his crew quickly hewed six thick trees down from the forest's border. At a distance, anyone unfamiliar with the woods wouldn't have noticed them missing. Up close, the stumps made it appear as if a giant, six-fingered hand had tried to burst forth from the earth only to have the fingers severed. The contractor offered to grind the stumps away, but the family all agreed it wasn't worth the expense. When construction was finished on each building, the family finally moved onto the land. They were the father and mother, two boys, the eldest and third children, and two girls, the second and youngest children. Once they had all settled in, the father began tilling up most of the land to prepare for planting season. As he tilled fresh rows closer and closer to the forest, he grew more and more uneasy. Being so near the woods made him feel like he had an audience, a crowd of onlookers he couldn't please no matter what he did. He was looking over his shoulder at the forest when one of his front tires hit something and jolted the entire tractor. Fortunately, he shut the machine down before the tiller hit the object, too. He climbed down to investigate and was confused to see a wide, mossy tree stump beneath the tractor. He stood up straight and looked around, trying to remember where they had cut those six trees from. He swore they had been much closer to the tree line. Otherwise, the property line dilemma never would have arisen. Plus, if one of the stumps had been in the middle of his future field, he absolutely would have had it ground away. He chose to pass over the stump for the time being and deal with it later. The following morning, the father awoke before dawn. His shouting woke the rest of the family shortly thereafter. They all rushed outside. At first, none of them understood what had upset him. They found him standing alone on the stoop, completely unharmed. He couldn't speak, only point. And he pointed at a stump in the front yard. Then he pointed to another stump just a few feet away. Then another still. The family quickly realized the house had been surrounded by six tree stumps that had not been there when they went to bed. Where did they come from? The mother asked. They were at the edge of the forest. How can they be here? The father asked in return. A scream made the parents turn back toward their children. The youngest was screaming at a feverish pitch and pointing to a snake that was wrapping itself around her ankle. The father ran to her, but involuntarily stopped when he realized the thing that had grabbed his daughter was not a snake. It was long, thin, and coated with clumps of dirt. When he followed it with his eyes, he saw it disappeared into the ground. The middle boy screamed next. His wrist had been grabbed and he was now being led across the yard. Roots. 
the children were being snatched by tree roots. The man felt something rough and cold wrap around his thigh and looked down to see a root had taken him too. Its grasp was unbreakable. The roots grabbed each member of the family in turn before any of them could run. All six of them were pulled toward a different stump. They all struggled individually, unable to help one another. The little girl who had been grabbed first also reached her stump first. The father watched in helpless terror as the stump broke free of the earth and stood upon its roots like an enormous wooden spider. His daughter fell onto her stomach as she tried to resist the root's pull, but it still dragged her beneath the raised stump. Once she was fully encircled in the dirt patch the stump had risen from, it came down heavy and fast on top of her. She vanished as if she had never existed at all. Through angry tears, the father looked to where he was being dragged and watched his own stump rise into the air. There was a wet thump, and the middle boy was gone. Now the father was directly below the largest of the stumps. Dirt rained down on his face as he begged to be spared, but the stump came down so quickly he didn't even realize it was coming. Out of all the stories in the book, the last one seemed the most fantastical. Tree stumps coming to life and squashing an entire family doesn't seem at all plausible, especially in 1997. The horrific story might have actually comforted me, helped me believe the entire book was pure fiction, if it hadn't been for the picture below the last line of text. Each story had an illustration either at the beginning or end. Most had been sketches of characters or scenes, but this picture, at the end of the tree stump story, was a printed photograph. It looked like it had been taken with a cheap disposable camera, as was common in 97. It depicted a small farmhouse. Six tree trunks were growing out of the ground, all within a few feet of the home. They were much too close to have been there when the house was constructed. The trunks bent near the house's roof, and all came together in the middle. A large, healthy-looking tree grew from their convergence, a tree that bore an uncanny likeness to the one from my waking dreams. Worst of all was the faint outline of a woman, camouflaged in the tree line behind the house. She could barely be seen there, but for her white teeth glowing through her wide grin. I thought there had finally been a story in which she had not appeared, but there she was. Oh, hey, I know where that is, my dad said. He had come into my room while I was enveloped in the photo and had seen it over my shoulder. I don't think he noticed the woman, though. You do? It's real? I asked. Yeah, we can go see it if you want to. It's right by the State Forest Preserve. It's a five-minute drive. Ten tops. I took my dad up on his offer. We loaded up in the car with my mom. The drive was only about five minutes long. We had to pull off the main road and do a short stint on rough gravel with a patch of grass growing down the middle. It ran directly along the edge of a dense forest. This forest here is protected by the state, my dad explained. No hunting or logging is allowed. I guess they decided they'd rather keep it the way it's always been. I thought this was wise. Very wise. I wondered if someone in the state government had read the book or maybe noticed how people seemed to vanish in and around the dark forest. We found the tree, growing around that now dilapidated old house like a cage. My parents didn't see them, but I saw everyone. Everyone from the stories was represented in the tree's bare branches. The hanging young woman smiled at me. Her child gave me a friendly wave. A rabbit climbed out of the moss-covered man's mouth and twitched its bloody nose at me. Others gave me somber nods or shook their heads sadly. One man, a man whose face was also represented by his four children, looked at me desperately. He was mouthing something. It took me a while to realize it was, get away. I told my dad the place had spooked me and we left. Visiting the house had been a mistake. How was I supposed to go on knowing a place full of so much horror was so close? 
I put that book back in the little library later the same day. I felt it had served as a warning to me, and I wanted others to have the same opportunity to learn of the danger that existed so close to our homes. I didn't wish the visions upon them, but they seemed to only be a side effect of the warning. And they fade away. At least they did for me. It took a long time, but the visions and dreams are now gone. I just hope their memory stays with me. I hope I never forget why I'm afraid of the forest, and always remember to respect that healthy fear. You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate and review this podcast wherever you like to listen. Reviews are the best way to support the podcast and help it grow. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash thewarningwoods. If you want more creepy content, including the images that accompany each story, follow me on Instagram at thewarningwoods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the warning woods. Thank you for listening.